Hello and good morning to everybody. Welcome and I want to thank you guys for joining us on a Saturday morning. Uh, maybe Saturday afternoon for some of you on the East Coast. Um, last week or just a couple days ago we uh, were talking about how to win with teens and we're going to continue that discussion today. Uh, Diana has uh, graciously uh, agreed to come on the show today. A couple days ago we had some uh, something came up and wasn't able to to come on. So I'm really excited about diving back into this discussion about winning with teens. Um, you know, a lot of you are aware that parenting accurately is a, it's it's brand new. It's something that we're just launching. And in part of the launch, I've decided to do something maybe out of the box, but something that I think will will help uh, many of you. And certainly, it'll at least give you an opportunity to be a part of, of what's going on and and. Uh, get to experience the beginning stages of this. And one thing I want to do is I want to give some things away. And I'm going to give, actually, I'm going to give away some free coaching. I, you know, we do do some coaching calls here. And I thought, you know, why not be generous? It's, it's a brand new year. It's a new season. We're starting over. And I know that some parents out there may feel overwhelmed, may feel like, you know, there's not many answers. Uh, but mostly just a lot of frustration. And, and I think that, I know in my experience, that it's important to not go through life alone. And whenever we, especially our parenting journey, right? Um, and sometimes it's hard to find people that understand where you might be. And, uh, you know, those of you who know me, know or, or spent any time around us here, you know that I have a big heart to reach parents that struggle to connect with their teens, uh, especially teens that are going through you know, like maybe a drug addiction, uh, they're depressed, uh, maybe have suicidal thoughts. You know, those are the teens, those are the young people that really need some special attention. And not necessarily, you know, um, too much or not enough, but it's it's something that it's a, it's a very sensitive time. And I, I went through this personally uh, with my daughter, and uh, it, it's a it's a very... Um, it's an interesting road to walk. It, it's very scary at times. I've been there and I've come out of it and I believe come out of it pretty su successfully. So I want to give you guys a chance, an opportunity to to take part in, a, in getting to know me and letting, giving me the ability to, and the opportunity to help you. So we'll be posting, I'm going to actually post uh, that link now. If you guys are interested in in some free coaching. This is not going to happen forever. I don't know when this will happen again. And, um, you know, and I, I'm going to shut it down eventually. I'm not going to be able to like do this forever. So, but I, I put in a link there. Uh, that's for a 30 minute free coaching session. So feel free to take advantage of that while it's available. Again, it won't be available forever. Um, but for now, it's there, and uh, I will remove it, that link, once uh, I feel like, okay, <laughs> I can't do any more free ones. But uh, take advantage of that. So always, as I always want to remind you, uh, our website, parentingaccurately.com, we have a free resource there for you. Uh, that would be really essential, I think, if you're trying to re reconnect with your kids. There's some great tips in there on how to build uh, that relationship uh, you know, even a broken relationship with your teen. Uh, it's really, really important, guys, to, to be active. You know, a lot of times we take our kids and we put them in therapy and counseling, and those things are good, but there's also the parent's part. And uh, your role in their life is super important. Uh, so we we'll definitely want to take advantage of that as well. So without any further ado, I want to welcome uh, my guest today, uh, Diana Bingham. And I apologize, guys, I, if I sound weird. I, I've been sick the last couple of days, so uh, getting over that. But uh, Diana, thank you for coming back on the show. Yeah, glad to be here. Uh, it's so good. Um, yesterday was a, a fun day, seeing all the posts about Valentine's Day and all the the love and and uh, you know, what did you do for your kids? We hung out and we actually went to the movie theater not to watch a movie. But we bought popcorn and snacks, went back to the house to watch a movie together at home. So we had a lot of fun. Oh, nice. Awesome. That's great. Well, again, I mean, we're here and, and let's talk more about winning with teens. Uh, you know, how is that possible? 
<laughs> sometimes it feels it could honestly it could feel like impossible. One of the things that really stuck out to me about our our discussion a couple of days ago uh, was about the emotional capacity of teens and and the emotional capacity is huge that they're all about emotions, but the logic and the the reasoning part of that sometimes that is you know you you mentioned that even in their brain their their logic and the reason that part of their brain isn't even fully developed yet so i know especially as a guy you know my approach can naturally be uh to the logic part of a situation and i have a logical answer and whenever they hear that it just it's like mumbling (laughs) you know and so i've seen how that doesn't work um and so it's important to you know really like talk to that emotional part with and bring in you know some reason so they can learn and grow in that too yeah yeah and some and you know you're also speaking from from wisdom not just your your the the logics are wisdom right like from experiences or whatever it may be and kids don't have that you know not only that but they tend to be very impulsive they they're they're going through a lot of um chemical changes as well like biological changes and whatnot um, and so you just have to keep in mind that, that, that impulsivity, how the, the logics in all of that, it's, it's hardwired a certain way at that point, And every teen is a little bit different. Um, so we have to keep that in mind, but also they're trying to establish independence. So a lot of times when you get into an argument with a kid, like they just want to be right. They'll even flip the script on you midway through the argument. And you're like, wait, you're contradicting yourself because they want to be right. They see you're winning. And so they're like, no, I need to be right. I'm trying to establish who I am and my opinions. And I really want them to be different from yours. You know, and so there's sometimes you're dealing with that and you're like, you get into the weeds of it all. You're like, I don't even know what we're talking about now. <laughs> we start yeah. off here and how do we end up here? I just, it happens sometimes. You know, and sometimes as a parent, I know that some of the critical moments that I've had when I've had intense moments with my kids, especially, you know, if we're trying to discuss something or I'm trying to show them something is I've had to determine when I need to hold my ground and when to let up a little bit. Yeah. And that's hard sometimes. Very, I've, it's very Honestly, good. and being very transparent, some of the hardest moments I've had is, are moments when I've had to admit that I was wrong. Because I, 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 just to be very clear here, um, I, I had I remember a time where I really thought that if I admit I'm wrong here, then I'm going to lose credibility with them. And that was my thought. You know, wrong, right or wrong, that's what I was thinking. I thought, well, if I'm wrong, then why should they listen to me? So maybe if you could speak to that a little bit, because I think that was a really critical time for me in my journey of parenting. I think sometimes when, with teens, um, it can be easy to admit when you're wrong, but there are times where it's definitely difficult. One is if we have our own pride issues, like we have a need to be right. But if you have a teen who's argumentative and it's hard to relate to that teen because they don't make it safe. Because when you are like rocking and rolling, you're loving on them really well, and then they're attacking you when you're like in a good place, you know, then it doesn't feel good or safe emotionally. Like it's normal to not feel safe, to be vulnerable you know, and to be like authentic like that with a teenager who's attacking you even when you're doing the right thing, you know? So if you did something wrong, it doesn't feel safe emotionally just to be like, Hey, you know what? I'm so sorry because you've been attacked even when things were good and and well, you know? So I think sometimes it feels like that, you know, because, okay, if you attack me when, when I'm right and when things are going good, that for me, then when I'm, when I actually made a mistake and I own it, it doesn't feel safe because if you attack me in the good times, you're definitely going to attack me on this one is what we're feeling. Right. And so I find that, um, we have to make sure we're in the right place emotionally, mentally be able to do that. I think it's still very critical because a lot of times teens, they, they need to be validated and it is healthy as an adult to admit when we're wrong. Cause now we're modeling it. They're modeling it. They're seeing, they're experiencing it and they feel validated. And so it is good to go ahead and do that anyway. In fact, you know, I was thinking about a conversation I had recently and I was like, you know, having to like, you know, have the same kind of situation. I'm like, hey, you know, I was thinking about this and I, I feel like I owe you an apology, you know, and and so, you know, and then they, they kind of rub it in sometimes. They're like, you think, you know, the little smart aleck like yeah, exactly in there and you're like, I'm not going to take the bait for a power struggle. It's an invitation like you want to fight, you know, and it's like, right. don't even bother. Don't even bother taking that bait. And it's like, well, you're right. You know, I'm so sorry for that. You know? how, about, how about yelling in the home? I heard I heard somebody say once that if you have to yell to get your kids to do something, you're creating a culture 
of like where they don't where they don't really trust you. You're creating a, a negative culture that tells them that they only have to do what you say once you start yelling. Well, you can condition kids to only listen when you yell. Because here's the thing. Um, sometimes I hear parents say um, they only listen when I yell. Yeah. And it's like, because here's what happens in those situations is is where I told you 10 times this and and I have to raise my voice and now you're actually listening to me. Then that means like what you've created as the, the adult in the home is a condition where you're only serious. You actually follow through when you're yelling. So it's like a trigger. It's a cue like, oh, you mean business because you're actually about to follow through, you know, but if you, but if you are someone who is like, Hey, um, like for example, you're going to take a cell phone away for a consequence, you know, it's like, Hey, you need to, you know, you need to turn in your phone for the night, you know, and they're like, but I have to do this or, but this, and you're like, no, you need to turn in. That's the rules. And they're like, you know, like, just give me the phone. I'm like, no. And they're like, you know, and you're like, so if you have to yell, you're like, cause you're saying it over and over again. One, one key is make sure you give a warning of a consequence. You know, there's no need to yell. Sometimes we yell because we're out of control. Right. And so, Actually, it is why we do it. And so, or we're trying to intimidate intentionally. And so part of it is like, look, you either give me the phone or I take the phone. If I have to take the phone, you're not going to get it back until even later. So, which is it, you know? And then they just, they like reluctantly give the, turn the phone in for the night. And so it's like, that was so much easier. I didn't have to yell. So instead right. just a warning of a consequence, like, Hey, you gotta do this, you do this. But if you do that, then here we go. You know? And then, and then you actually follow through, they take you seriously and you didn't have to yell. But a lot of times, you know, as a parent, we feel like ah, they only listen when I yell. It's like because you condition them that way, like you don't you don't actually follow through on anything. You tell them what the rule is, but you don't enforce the consequence soon enough. You don't. Do you know what I mean? And so I think that's what's happening in those situations is, is the relationship has been built where you see that there's no other option besides yelling, you know. Right. You know, and, and a lot of times teenagers don't like to be wrong. You know, okay. they, they want to be right. So. Uh, maybe one way for you know, you come to a situation and you've got to correct the teen. I, I've also uh, read something where it said that it suggested that, you know, give them options rather than, oh, no, you're wrong and say, okay, th- I'm going to give you three options of how you can make this right. And instead of say, just coming in with a, you know, with the sword and saying, no, you're wrong and start, you know, hacking away at them, uh, you more or less come in, come in from a different approach and just saying, okay, well, yeah, this might be wrong, but here's here's how we can correct it. Here are your choices of what you can do. You know, the more choices we give them, sometimes the easier we can get through a situation or like a heated moment. So do you mean like they're wrong in their opinion or wrong in their action where there is like there should uh, be a consequence? Let's say, let's say action. Okay. Yeah. That happens a lot, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I think there's a couple things like, so one of them is if they're like wrong in their opinion, we have to remind ourselves that adolescents, they're trying to develop their own independence, which means they have to test out theories and opinions and they have, they're overly confident. They're invincible, right? That's how they developmentally see things. That's why they're so opinionated and they think they're right. They're trying to establish, this is my opinion. And therefore I'm very confident in this opinion. I want to test it out. And when they have a hypothesis, like they're like, it's do or die, it's black or white, you know? And so that's why it comes across strongly. So whenever they, it's an opinion situation, then um, that's when you're like, well, do you think that maybe this could be another scenario? You know, you can pitch it out that way. But if it's like where they make a mistake, you know, they behaviorally like do something they shouldn't do. Um, like they, um, you know, stayed over at friend's house too long. You know, when you had like a rule of thumb, they had to drive home by a certain time. Then it's like, okay, they made a mistake. So what? I'm not quite sure. Like the consequences as far as choices. I don't. I don't know that I would give kids a choice of their punishment if that's what you're asking. No. Um, sometimes it, you know, it, that could end up being, you know, not helpful in some situations. Yeah, I think the more, you know, it seems the more confident we are in in, in our plan, the yeah. better. And so it's probably really important to have a plan already before we go in and talk with our kids about, you know, so, you know, if it's a behavioral issue or something like that, that way we don't appear to be like, well, we really don't know what's going on. Yeah. So the options are really great when you're giving them options on how to follow the rule, not after they made a mistake right. necessarily. You know, it's like, hey, we have to turn the phone. I don't want to turn the phone. Okay. But you got to turn the phone. You got to do this. You do that. You know? Right. That makes and sense. So that, that's when the options are really good. You're giving them a choice on how to follow through, you know? So um, not a choice on whether or not they follow through. That's, that's different too. So it's like, hey, I need you to 
clean your room. You know, I need you to pick up your stuff off the floor, you know, um, in the living room. And so it's common area. We got to get it cleaned up by bedtime or something like that. And so we got to get cleaned up by seven o'clock. I don't know. And it's like, you can either like pick up this, start with this area like first, or you can start with that area first, which one do you choose? Do you want help or do you want to do it on your own? Like those are good times to bring in options and choices on how to follow through on the rules. And so it's like, here are the rules, here's the umbrella. And, um, within this confinement, this boundary, this is my expectations. You can, you can follow it however you want. You can do it right now. Or you can wait till six 30, you know, whatever it looks like. But then when it comes to like they broke a rule and you're having to enforce a consequence, it's like, well, since you chose to do this, you know, you chose this consequence. That's when you're just like presenting it. You can give them a warning, a heads up, but then you actually just follow through because, yeah, that's kind of the structure of how that would work with, with someone who's really trying to test limits. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. How, mm-hmm. how would you deal with a person like a, a teen that's, that really just is really, that's not very open? that is you know appears to be going through maybe depression uh and they're they're always in their room uh and then when you try to talk to them they just have a hard time opening up what what can we do as parents to really kind of break through that those walls yeah so anytime they're not wanting to open up you want to work on relationship so you i think of like um i think about love and truth or relational stuff and like truth is like wisdom, it's correction, instruction, direction. I'm trying to like, hey, let's talk what's going on. And if the relation, like maybe it's bad timing. Maybe you have a really good relationship with your teen, but it's just not good timing. Like you're trying to talk to them at nine thirty at night and they're just like, they're not feeling it. They're tired. They're exhausted. And they don't want to have deep conversations in. Or maybe it's like just, you know, they, they ha- they're they they trying to, they're in the middle of homework and they're trying to get stuff done and you're wanting to talk because it's convenient for you as a parent. So you have to think about timing, right? So it doesn't mean that they don't want to talk. But if you have a kid who's constantly not wanting to open up and talk about things, like, then you want to focus on relations, the relationship, you know? So it doesn't, so what that means is like, okay, so I don't have to talk about anything like right now. Um, but let's just, let's just focus on like having quality time. Let's go out, let's go shopping, let's go have some fun. And then, and then they trust you and they feel comfortable in the relationship. And then you start talking with them every now and then, you know, um, or maybe you say like, okay, well you don't have to talk, but you can listen. Here's what I'm seeing is like, I really care about you. And so you're starting even, even in the conversations that you need to have, you don't have to always wait. So please don't hear me say that, well, just wait and start, you know, having fun with your kid all the time. Right. But you can start conversations off, but start it off with a heart because we want to have like what you're saying in the other um, day, the other day in our meeting was those heart to heart conversations. So even if you have to have a conversation right then and there, start off with a heart, you know, like ha- like a, a connection, a connecting point where it's like, I really care about you. And I, I feel like you've been kind of withdrawn. And so I'm just concerned and I, I just wanted to let you know that, I, you know, I'm here if you need me or um, I think that maybe I'm wondering if maybe this is this friendship that you have over here is kind of discouraging you or maybe you recently had a breakup, right? The kid had a breakup and you're like, hey, like, is that, is it this still bothering you? And they're like, I don't want to talk about it. Like, okay, well, I just want you to know that. And if and as a parent, you kind of have like this little instinct, like I think this is what the problem is and I think this is why they're struggling because they think X, Y, Z. So go with that. Um, that internal like gut sometimes be like, is it maybe this, you know, like, so sometimes you give them multiple choice so they can like give minimal answers. (laughs) So if you don't have a conversational kid, totally fine. You know, just say like, well, I think maybe it's this, is it this or something else, you know? And they're like, no, it's something else. Is it this? Yes. Okay. Is it because of that? And that's what you're struggling with. So, so you kind of have to listen to your gut. I know that kind of sounds weird, but some kids will like just want to give minimal answers and that's fine. You also have to keep in mind, like, as parents, sometimes we, like, we love conversation and deep talk and processing, you know, um, not all parents, but some of us do. And so not our, all of our kids like that. So if the only time you're hanging out with your kid is all these deep conversations, it's not fun. You know, that could be a super big drag. So you have to balance all that. And, and every kid's different. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, it's just kind of lead them a little bit, you know, get them to, to bite a little and then just lead them. And then, you know, before you know it, they'll they can open up. Yeah. And think about your demeanor too. Like sometimes like I'm just tired and I know I need to talk, you know, um, to a kid and I'm just like, I'm not feeling it, you know, like I don't want to talk right now, you know? And so I have to make sure like, why would they want to talk to me if I'm like, I'm coming in serious, 
You know, yeah. like I need to make sure that I my heart posture really matters. Like, am I coming in actually truly interested? Am I humble? You know, am I concerned or am I just being nosy? Am I um, am I just trying to get this conversation over with? Or is my is my intent just to correct? Like, you need to you need to stop hanging out in your room and you need to come out here and do this. You know, like if that's where I'm coming from, then they're probably not going to want to open up. That would make sense. So we have to keep in mind that we also set like the environment for whether or not our teen wants a teen wants to have a conversation. And so we have to check in with ourselves. That's so important because we're like the thermostat, you know, right. and sometimes our kids can like they could be super negative and we we adjust. We become thermometers and we adjust to the temperature of the room based on what the kids set in the room, you know, especially a kid who's constantly argumentative or constantly withdrawn and or whatever. It's like, we like to have fun too. But if you have a, a kid that's really down and maybe you just, you know, you're tired, you know, you feel exhausted, maybe you feel hopeless. And you're like, I don't know what to do. I've said all the things, but I just feel hopelessness. Or maybe yeah. like you're a busy parent and you're not setting aside, you're not able to set aside enough time to be with your kids. Sometimes that happens as well. So we just have to make sure we check in with ourselves and like, I think once we have someone that maybe, maybe we can process, like you're talking about doing a consultation. So Jason, if people were to do a consultation with you, you can kind of assess like, well, maybe you need to do this or this. But um, but you, as you process with someone like Jason, you know, then you'll be like, oh, I think that maybe I've just been distracted. And so um, so maybe they don't feel like they can trust me because it's been a long time since I've ever checked in and see how they're doing. You know, I've always made it about how when you get chores done or we need to get homework in you know, that we haven't had a lot of like just downtime just to relate and have fun. You know, and those times are important, you know, and, and even in business, whenever, you know, one of the things I learned early on was, you know, in, in a management role, you, you have to correct people and, and teenagers are people just younger. And it's really important. You, you mentioned to start off with like the a heart connection, you know, and so like to kind of translate what I learned in, in the business side is, you know, anytime that we correct anybody, you know, it was, I was always taught to start with the positive, you know, and then add the correction and then end with the positive. And so that the majority of the conversation felt good, but there was some, it kind of can take the sting out of correction. And as teenager, te many teenagers don't really love correction, that might be a way to, you know, you start with the heart, bring the, the correction, talk about that, and then end with the positive. Yeah. And that could be very helpful. Mm -hmm. uh, wow. Uh, how about, you know, the, there, there's the kids that are just like, maybe they're out of the mood or maybe, you know, they don't want to talk, but then there's some that are literally in their own world and they're, they're not happy. Let's say, you know, parents are divorcing or just some things are happening in, in their own in life that's, that's caused, that's out of their control and it's impacted them greatly. Uh, how would you, I mean, same approach, I'm guessing, with trying to build that relationship. But do you have any keys or anything that would help kind of get through that initial depression or however, you know, that, that hardship? Yeah, um, I think it probably depends on each situation. I, I, I'm an advocate for counseling. So even if it's not a professional counselor, if it's a, you know, someone who's like within the school or a trustworthy like adult in the family, um, just making sure that you give your kids a village, you know, it takes a village to raise the kids. It really yeah. truly does. Cause there are some things you, that your kid will never be comfortable completely talking about because you are the disciplinarian or you, they, they know you love how you react on certain topics. Maybe you're comfortable talking about this topic, about sports, but not about this topic over here. And so we have our own biases as adults. And, and so, and we are not always aware of it. So some conversations are really difficult for kids to have with their parents. Um, in certain seasons. And obviously we want to be the go-to for everyone, but we may not, um, we may not be able to for different yeah. reasons. I think it is having other healthy people that they feel drawn to that they can connect with. Um, I think that's a really good place where, okay, I feel like I have someone who supports me, this teacher, this coach, they really care for me, this aunt, this uncle, this counselor, whoever it is, even the school counselor and say like, so I feel like it's not going to come back and, and, and bite me. So they go and can process and just build there. So I think it's important just to have your kids surrounded by other healthy adults that they may feel more comfortable talking to. Like me, I'm a task oriented mama, you know, my husband, like he's very, he's very much like warm and caring, not that I'm not warm and caring, but right. I just present a little differently sometimes, you know? And so there are some things that my kids are, are going to want to go to my, go to their dad about more than their mom, you know? So just having other like healthy people that you trust that 
can you can bring um, alongside. So that way they can come in because if like you mentioned divorce, like they may not want to share with you because a lot of times kids don't want to talk about stuff if they think it's going to hurt you. You right. know, so you're going if your your family is going through a divorce, have other adults in in the in the um, in the scene here um, because you may feel like well if I say this then you're going to feel bad you know because it directly affects you as mom or dad. And so I thought that's where I would say like in those, those situations, like bring other people in and, and not, not try to go through that alone because you're going to have biases. You're going to have some things that are going to pull up whenever they talk. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So Samantha wrote in and she has a question. Uh, here's what she wrote. She said, um, my 14 year old son has a girlfriend and we have <laughs> talked about respect for himself and her not to be in intimate situations. Long story short, under the girl's parents watch, he admitted they had sex. Mm-hmm. We were de- we're devastated and wondering where to go from here. She's 15 and I'm angry, lost, angry. I'm angry but lost. Uh, my son started acting up and running away till he confessed. He was uh, so disrespectful and angry. Help. Wow. So my mom, my heart goes out. Those situations are really challenging. We want to protect our kids um, for as long as we can. You know, we want them to have innocence in childhood, and we don't want them to speed up all that stuff. There's so many different things that can can happen there. And we feel betrayed by the other adults that we trusted to watch. And, and those adults may have been um, like watching them as best they could, but sometimes those situations arise. Yeah. And so, yeah. um, and so it's really important that the mom not take it personal, you know? So Samantha, I would say um, it may be really hard, but try not to take it personal um, because our children's decisions are not always about us. It's not always a reflection that you're a poor parent or anything like that. Um, but there are just situ- like kids have sexual desire, you know, and, and in certain situations, like where there's enough leniency and, and whatever, like it's just, that's just going to happen. So, and not all households have the same rules of supervision and whatnot. And those temptations are definitely going to be there. The key is that you're walking on holy ground with your son right now. So anytime your kids make a mistake, make a poor decision in life, you want to remain calm and loving as much as reasonable because it's not about – you can't always prevent the the poor decisions, but you want to let your kid know no matter what you do in life or go through, I'm here for you. So it's not about helping your kids make the right decisions all the time. It's also how I can help my child repair and recover after they make mistakes. So, you know, am I do I, am I emotionally safe for them to come to and process like, okay, so you know what, you – you know – sex probably feels good, right? So you probably enjoyed that. And so that's a normal human experience. Um, I, I would have liked for you to, to wait and all this other stuff, but you know what? Let's talk about how we can manage that sexual desire um, so that you don't go through that again. Um, because it could be that maybe you guys haven't had a lot of conversations about sexual health and development, which is fine. It's not a point of shame or anything like that. But um, but how how are you how are you with talking about those topics? And does he feel safe to process that with you? Because when your kids make mistakes, you want to be there um, for them to help, you know, um, but, but sometimes we get really reactive um, because we're protective. Yeah. It's, and it, it's so easy to feel, you know, that we're offended as the parent. Like it's a, it's like you did something against us as the parents. Our and, rules, right. They broke our rules. We don't want yeah. you to do these things. And they, they blatantly broke it. Yeah. Yeah. And so maintaining that connection by, you know, coming in with some understanding and, also some care and some love and let's help. Okay. What do we do from here? Uh, she also mentioned that, you know, they're, they put restrictions on when and where they can meet. Uh, you know, and I know that it's a tough place because if you constrict so much, if, if they're depending on the type of child, they may just, uh, like she mentioned that he ran away. Uh, you know, you know that there's, so there's that tendency. So you have to really be careful <laughs> to put the restrictions that are necessary, but yet, not clamp so tight that he just takes off. Yeah. I kind of view it like parenting is like, there's almost like two, um, how do I describe it? Like two components you want to think about. You want to think about on one side, like where you're at and the issues that, that got brought up, you know, within you, within your heart, within your mind, with all of that. And then how you present to your kid. I'm not, it's not about being two faced. It's about different layers. Right. So we process our emotions with our kids, but they're not, they shouldn't be the person we go to to process all of our anger, um, disrespect and all of that. Um, because then it's going to hurt our, the relationship that we have with them. So if, if your kid broke all these rules and, and did all this stuff, then it's like, um, I like to say shelf it, don't stuff it. 
So put all of those emotions that you're having like over here to the side and process it with someone, whether it be like having that consultation with Jason or whatever that looks like, or you know, your own personal counselor, yeah. have someone or a good friend, have someone you can process all that stuff with. So you can have like kind of a clearer mind on, on what you need to do when you respond to your, your child. And we don't want it to be like this big, huge conglomeration that gets mixed up and stuff gets pulled up out of us in conversation with our kids or how we react to them and respond to them. Um, that actually hurts the relationship. So I almost kind of view it like as two different like parts that we need to be aware of. You know, there's this division. So that way there's some things that don't come up when we're talking with, with a teen uh, that we don't want it to, we just don't want that to influence, um, you know, our relationship with our kids. Right. Uh, does that kind of make sense? Yeah. I mean, it's a pretty heavy event. Definitely. You know? And so you, yeah, you don't want that to separate, you know, I mean, the parent and the teen. Oh, I mean, I think about what on this side as a parent, think of all the things that are going to come up. You're going to fear like, is he going to run away again? Is he going to drop out of school? Is he going to get her pregnant? Is he going to have STDs? Like, are they doing drugs? Like, what what are the other parents going to do? Is he going to run away and think like, oh, I like to live with them because those parents over there are way looser on rules. So that they're the fun house, you know, and what else is going to happen? I'll never see him again. You know, it's just going to come up with all kinds of like what all kinds of stuff is going to come up. And so it's, it's okay to have a place to process all like it, there's, it's okay to feel all of those emotions, you know, um, you're grieving, you're grieving the, the innocence, the, the loss of innocence for your, for your son and, and betrayal. Like you trusted him, you trusted her, you're okay right. with dating maybe. And now you're also having feelings of like, probably you're feeling like, man, did I fail? Did I fail as a parent? Like, um, what did I do wrong? How could I have prevented this? You know, some of these thoughts, like when you're in the middle of a gun battle, you're not going to say like, oh, why did this happen to me? It's like you're in the middle of of like like bullets are firing off. So it's like process the why later. Process now. Like, what do I need to do about it right here, right now? Okay, first I need to take care of this, this, and this, you know, and then like how do I need to respond to him out of love? How can I still be kind and not have anger and resentment when I discipline or talk to him? Um, because that'll push him away and make him rebel more. But you also don't want to be so lenient um, that his emotional reactions is running away controls how you parent at the same time. You want to make it right. informative, but not the deciding factor on what you do. And 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 there's no like clear cut answer on that. It's a situation by right. case to case. And so you need someone to kind of process that out with yeah. to, to know exactly what to do there. Yeah. And like you said, every, every situation is different. Um, she also mentioned that they're, they're, they're very open about sex and that they have set boundaries and they're working with him on setting boundaries, which is huge. That's really important. I, I went through, it reminds me of a situation I went through with my daughter, uh, very similar. And I worked with her on setting boundaries, but I also had to go a step further and I had to go to the parents of the boy and, yeah. and explain because he was not respecting the boundaries that I'd set. I had a conversation with him too. And nobody was respecting, you know, the things that I'd said. So I took it a step further and went to had a talk with the parents. In this case, you know, and not, I knew that that was risky. I, I didn't know them. Uh, and it was risky because you don't ever know what I didn't. I don't know anything about that family. So I didn't know what I was walking into. Uh, I didn't know if they would be like, well, th- that's perfectly fine here in this house. But and so my wife and I went over there to, to talk with them and. Uh, had a good conversation. They had no idea what was going on and they supported me and they've supported our efforts. So then now it wasn't just me setting boundaries, but also they were helping to set boundaries and that helped the situation quite a bit. That's Um, good. And and not everybody has that. Some people have all the parents, like they have completely different value system and everything else. And it ends up being a nightmare. Yeah, it could be. And that's where you want to have those heart talk conversations. Like, Hey son, like, I am hurt by that. Like, I'm sorry for my reaction that I had the other day. Um, you matter to me and I, I, I'm, I want to help you with stuff and make good choices. And, and so here's where we're at. Here's what I'm thinking, like what's going on with you, you know, yeah. uh, see if you guys can have a relationship talk and not, don't have the in, the outcome of that conversation doesn't need to be, I need to control you. You need to follow through on rules. You know, like the first conversation you need to have, it needs to be about like, what happened? Where do we, where do we, you know, not see eye to eye? What's going on? How do we need to repair this? You know, and then uh, maybe you table some conversations like, okay, well, let's talk about those things later, you know? So, but it's going to have to be a lot of different, you know, touch points like, Hey, where are we at here? Right. Well, and then also I'd, I'd see, I'd look at any situation like this, that that's tough 
as an opportunity to, to grow in our relationship with our kids. Yeah. You know, because I mean, working through that with her, yeah, there were tough times, but now, like, it really strengthened our relationship. And two years later, about a year and a half later, now she looks back at the situation and she thanked me for being strong with her, for, you know, pulling her up, at, you know, out of that mess because uh, she was, on, I mean, she was on a different road. She was on a road to destruction, but um, I was able to kind of enforce some boundaries because when we talk about boundaries, one thing that, that I think is important is that there's age appropriate boundaries. And we obviously our goal as parents is to help our kids learn how to make set their own boundaries. But if they're not mature enough in, in whatever boundary we're trying to set to set their, and I've told her, look, I'm going to set this boundary for you because you're not able to do it yourself, you know? And then and I really try to explain that, you know, thoroughly with her so that she understands, like, I'm not trying to just be a mean dad. I'm doing this to protect you. I'm doing this because, you know, one day you're going to be able to do it for yourself and you're going to need to. Uh, but for now I'm stepping in and I'm, I'm going to help you out here. Yeah. And if they say you don't trust me, it's like, it's not about trust. It's about right. uh, it, how responsible you're able to be. Like if you're not, if you're not able to manage that sexual desire, you're not able to manage things certain, in a certain way, then, then that's okay. You're just not able to do it right now. And so until then, it'll be my responsibility to do that. You know, I think those are really good conversations for sure that need to be had. Yeah, definitely. And we have to remind ourselves as parents, it's not our job to control our kids. Now we do have responsibility if they go out and like, you know, vandalize a building or whatever, you know, but our job is to set fair rules and give um, appropriate consequences and follow through on that. You know, and if our rules and our consequences are good, then eventually that's how they learn self-control. It's how they learn how to make good decisions because we enforce it consistently. Um, so our job's not to control our kids. It's our children's job to learn self-control. And that's how they learn it. They develop it because we have healthy rules and appropriate consequences and we're consistent. You know, and when they break rules, like we're still loving, but we still enforce it. Like, I'm sorry, kiddo. Like, because you chose this, this is what the consequence is. But sometimes we're like, we get so fired up, we're like, you know, or maybe the arguments escalate or we up the ante and because we're so heated, we up the ante and we like, oh, yeah, well, then we're also going to do this consequence and this one. And, you know, and, and that's where it gets kind of um, chaotic is when uh, all the emotions just start colliding. Yeah. And that, that's a that could be a dangerous place. Yeah. Yeah. You know, some kids blow up and take off, um, you know, okay. and yeah, it's mm -hmm. it's really important to be to be sensitive and uh, you know, especially if you can get that, I think the, when you have a severe situation like that, it is an opportunity to build that relationship. And if you can capitalize and, and just build that relationship, especially if you can get the, the child to, or the teen to feel like they can talk to you. Um, you know, in my case, my kid's mother, you know, my daughter's mother, you know, is three hours away. So, you know, uh, I've went through a divorce and remarried now and my kids didn't feel completely, they felt comfortable around, you know, my wife, but, you know, in their minds, and back then, uh, she was still the stepmom, so that they didn't really want to get into a conversation like that with her, and I really was able to, to just continue showing love to them and showing that they can talk to me, and I asked tough questions. Yeah, that's you good. Know, I, I was not, I, at first it was a little weird. I, you know, I didn't know what, how they were going to respond, but I really got very, very honest with them and very open and just said, look, you know, I'm your dad. Yeah, I'm not your mom, but you can talk to her as well, but you're with me most of the time and I need to know what's going on. And, you know, I know it's uncomfortable, but I really tried to create, I tried to create an atmosphere where they could, now they tell me too much. <laughs> like, you know, I don't need to know that, but... <laughs> I would never tell them that, honestly. Uh, right. I, I appreciate the that flow. I appreciate that they're open with me because you know that's I it, I value that so much, and it's really saved our relationship. And think about how you got to that place. You know, by being consistent, by still ask, having difficult like what is emotionally difficult conversations, like actually going there, by remaining calm, by avoiding shaming strategies or guilt trips. Yeah. You know, and when you, if you do make a mistake, owning it, you know, it's, it's not like this secret formula. It's the same stuff, but it's about being consistent over time. Right. You know, that's what's really important. That's what develops that level where they can, um, they can trust and be, be open and transparent. Yeah. It's huge. And, you know, 
like I like the theme of parenting accurately is that we believe in that connection between the parents and the kids. And that connection is powerful if we'll learn how to use it, learn how to tap into it. And, yeah. you know, so when we come up to a situation like this, it's a perfect opportunity. Uh, she also mentioned that, um, you know, that the parents knew about a month before she did. So she kind mm-hmm. of feels like, like going to them may be pointless, but you never know. I mean, they may be feeling the same as you. They may be unsure, like, you know, what, you know, I don't know. So it really... You don't want to assign intent, you know, you yeah. don't know the motivation. So maybe they, maybe your son portrayed like, my mom is horrible. And so don't, you know, or maybe the, maybe, I don't know, who knows what was going on in their mind. Maybe they, maybe they don't know how to have hard conversations. Maybe they're scared that, you know, you're going to sue them or you know, who knows what was going on, but it does, but it's, it's normal to have all different kinds of thoughts about it, but just like, you know, I'm going to give benefit of doubt here. This conversation needs to be had. And, and it's like, so even adults, don't make great decisions. And so you having that conversation still with them saying like, Hey, I understand that you guys knew a month in advance, like help me to understand like, um, you know, how we can move forward, have, have open communication. Cause these things are actually very important to me, For sure. you know, again, ma- maintaining calm, you know, like you've got like over here, your own thoughts about it, irritation about it, leave it here at the door as you're like talking with them over here. It's like, help me understand what's going on on the inside. You're like, Oh my gosh, what's, you know, and, and finding a place where you can just like, okay, those are my, my issues. I don't have to like, you know, be a certain way with them. Like who knows what was going on in them. Right. Like, you know, and kids, might be are, even kids are clever. All, you know, in, in this case that I shared, when we kind of confronted the parents, I mean, the, the kids, both kids uh, were, they presented everything in a way that where they thought everything was fine. Mm-hmm. And yeah. so you never really know what the other parents thinking. So, yeah. You know, consider, you know, going out there and taking that step. I'm sure. And how much do they really know? Because it could be yeah. that they say, oh, yeah, the parents know. Um, but how much do they know? Did they like say like, oh, we just we kind of went a little too far and that's it. Or, you know, you know what I mean? So yeah. it, who knows? Right. It's tough. It's a tough situation. Yeah. Um, but she also mentioned that, you know, she is thankful for this time. She doesn't feel alone anymore. And that's I'm telling good. you, there are so many parents in, in this in this boat, so many parents that are. I mean, there's no way they, there's, you're not alone at all. No. Um, it, unfortunately, it's something that many, a lot of people don't talk about. And I think that, you know, cultures kind of framed this new, uh, it's pretty much a culture now among teenagers. Uh, if you talk to them openly and they're clear with you, they'll say everybody's doing it. And so doesn't mean it's okay, but, uh, I think that because it's all over TV, it's all over social media, it's all over everywhere, we can become desensitized to it and then just not talk about it. And we let, you know, other sources send that message. Yeah. And I think as a culture, for the most part, we tend to have um, no training in how to have difficult conversations in a healthy way. Right? Yeah, that's true. How many people do you know personally? You know, it's a rhetorical question for everybody watching. How many people do you know can have difficult questions in a healthy way? Right. You could probably put them on one hand, if at all. You know, and even those people that you know mess up sometimes. You know, and so it could be that those parents didn't know how to have that conversation. You know, it could be that you didn't know how to have it with your son, and maybe you exploded, and he's like, "That's why he's running off." And maybe like, you know, your kid, the kids didn't know how to present it, so they stuffed it and didn't share it with anyone. You know what I mean? So who, like, it's so I think that's what parenting accurately is all. We want to be intentional yeah. when we parent, um, but we also want know that we can't do it alone, and we're not alone. For you sure. know, having tough conversations in a healthy way is a challenge, and it's a skill that we have to intentionally develop. Yeah, that's for sure. You know, so I just want to take a moment and inject here. You know, in the beginning of the broadcast, maybe you just tuned in or you tuned in a little bit after we started. Uh, for a limited time, I am giving away a 30 minute free coaching sessions uh, with myself. Um, the link is at the top of the comments. Uh, so this will not be available for very long. I'm going to have to take that down soon. Um, but feel free to take advantage of that, this opportunity uh, while it's available. Diana, this is a really good conversation. I, it's very powerful. It's very helpful. Um, you know, what what else would you say? I mean, I know that we can go in many different directions um, concerning teens because, I mean, the sexual part of that conversation is huge. Uh, and then, you know, drugs, I think, is another one that's 
massive and especially you know here in california you know weed is legal um and so i mean even in the schools it's everywhere Uh, middle schools it's like drugs in middle schools is um pretty 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 heavy and so again like as a parent it was that's protecting our kids and setting boundaries uh, we're kind of going against the culture we're kind of going against what the norm is i mean what kind of advice or keys could you give parents that would help us navigate that i think i would say two things and i don't remember if we talked about this last time but there's this principle of first mention yeah i love it someone learns about a topic that becomes their mindset and lens so if we wait till culture school um tv shows teach our kids something about sex or about drugs or about relationships or work ethic or whatever, then you're, you're climbing an uphill battle. I mean, it doesn't mean it's impossible. So the first thing is be intentional talk about all, all the things, <laughs> you right. know, don't do not think about it as a one time conversation. It needs to be an ongoing dialogue. So like, let's just, we've been talking about sexual health and development and all of that. So it starts when they're little, you start like, here's the name of the body parts, you know, it's normal. Right. It's, just, it's an elbow, you know, that's a nose. Like there's your penis, you know, <laughs> and so you just see your kids. When they're three and four and five, six, like here's the name of the body parts. No big deal. It's not shameful, but some are private. And here's why. And as they get older, they're going to school and you're like, boundaries. We're teaching about boundaries. Hey, it's not okay for people to talk to you like that. You know, it's um, here's how we stick up for ourselves. It's important to stick up for yourself, you know. Um, but but if someone's being mean to you, then you we don't play with people who are mean to us. So say, sorry, you feel that way. And you move on and do something else. And then when they get older and they start dating, then you're like, hey, it's not. So now that the conversation about boundaries and how to be assertive and what's private, what's not private, all of that builds up. And now they understand because so many teens are involved in dating relationships where there's, there's abuse, you right. know, so there's pressure to, yes. um, to give in, you know, to, 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 to the pressure to have sex and all of that. So there's all kinds of stuff like um, dating violence for 15 year olds, 16 year olds. And so all that builds up. So we want to make sure it's an ongoing dialogue, age appropriate, and it's building upon the other. So that's the first one is make sure it's really intentional conversations about all the things as much as you within reason can do, you know, and don't always be like super serious. Like it's, it's terrible. You don't do that. You know, like it's like, Hey, just matter of fact, like this is life and I'm teaching it. I'm imparting something, some wisdom to you. And when you have struggles and when you make bad decisions, we talk about it, no big deal. You know, like, oh, you probably shouldn't have done that. So here's another way you can solve that problem. And so that's that's one thing. The second thing is get into community. You know, book a free 30-minute consultation, a coaching session with Jason. Like, hello, this is going to be some wisdom right here. He's walked through some things with family life and his own life. So this is great. You know, so connect with community because there's no way you're going to think of everything you know, I, when I, I'm having to have a deep dive understanding of like how to monitor social media and cell phone, you know, it's safety first, you know, not privacy first. And right. so, so I'm like reaching out to another mom who's got kids, you know, kiddo in college and they're much older. And so like reach out to people who've been there, done that, you know, get perspective. There's no way you're going to learn it all on your own. So there's no shame in that. There's no, so find healthy people who can help you out. Yeah. That's what I would say. Yeah. Awesome. So true. That's really good. You know, I can't believe the time is going by so fast again. Uh, you know, if you're, if you're watching here and, and you've, this has helped you or, you know, please hit the like button, hit the love button, uh, to tag somebody that you know in the comments that if you know somebody that could be, that could benefit from this, this, uh, this time that we've had here, um, that helps us get the word out. It helps promote the page and, uh, we really need to do that because I mean, this is valuable information. We're adding a lot of value here and, um, we want as many people to, to get this as possible. So thank you again for your time. Uh, and it's, it's always good. And uh, we definitely will look forward to, to having you back on again. Thanks for having so me. So before we end, though, I, I really want to, I know that some may want to, to go deeper with you. I know you've got a lot going on. You've uh, just finished a challenge uh, and brought in some people. So uh, for those that, that are interested in getting to know you and, and follow you, uh, We'll put the, the links that you're going to share in the comments here in just a few minutes, but uh, definitely take a moment and, and share with us what, what's happening. Yeah, the, the best thing is just to join my free Facebook community. I have a private Facebook community. It's private because I want people to feel free to share stuff and not think that someone's going to repost it. So that would be the first step. But if you already know, like you guys want to do something more, just go, you can, they can even go to dianabigham.com and just learn about a lot of different services that we have. But I would say if they want an ongoing thing to, to definitely plug into that free community. 
Awesome. Very good. Thank you again, and I hope that you enjoy the rest of your your Saturday, the rest of your weekend. And for everybody that's joined us, thank you as well for joining us, and we look forward to uh, next time. Bye, guys.